Welcome everyone, my name is David Wood and I chair London Futurists. Technology potentially changes everything. That's a possibility we frequently explore at these London Futurist events. Technology potentially changes the tasks we do at work, how we study, how we create art, how we find our life partners, how we keep ourselves healthy, how we might avoid death, and even today's subject, how we might change the way we look after the bodies of people who are deceased. The point is that the concept of being dead or being deceased is itself changing. Once upon a time, if your heart stopped beating, that was it, you were dead. Once upon a time, if you stopped breathing, that was it, you were dead. But better medical interventions can nowadays reanimate people who had stopped breathing or whose hearts had stopped beating. In the future, even better medical interventions might allow the reanimation of people who have been placed into long-term, low-temperature cryopreservation when their hearts had stopped beating and they were declared legally dead. That's a remarkable possibility. But to enable more people to take advantage of that remarkable possibility, it's likely that legal frameworks and regulatory systems will have to change. To explain about this and to set the scene for our discussion today, I will hand over in a moment to Jordi Sandalinas, our speaker today, who is a lawyer, a drone pilot, a professor of the course of drone law at the Universitat Alberta de Catalunya in Spain, and he has many other strings to his bow. He is of great relevance for this meeting, the director of the European Cryonic Law and Policy Research Initiative, which is based in Barcelona. Jordi, welcome to London Futurists. The stage is yours. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and, and all our uh, audience. So, uh, um, if you allow me, I well, I, I'll uh, introduce myself. My name is Jordi Sandalinas. Of course, um, as, as uh, David uh, said, uh, I'm a lawyer. I've been practicing for 20 plus years, and and I'm I've been also interested in this type of of legal regimes that that they're not as usual as we are are, are used to in in a sense as as david pointed out uh technology uh follows uh like so fast and and it's advancing uh, so, uh such a phenomenal uh, exponential rate that obliges uh, legal practitioners to enact uh, legal instruments as as fast as possible. Uh, I'm I'm also uh, teaching space law uh, at the University of Madrid. Space law is also a matter that uh, because of technology, uh, uh, the legislative uh, efforts of the state members of the international community must uh, must really uh, work hard uh, in order to uh, enact and publish uh, effective laws and regulations capable to, uh, to, to tell what to do in, in certain type, types of situations, right? Uh, it happens with cryonics as well. Uh, curiously, um, of course, as, as David uh, said, um, it can happen that one, uh, one person after uh, having a, uh, being declared death could happen not maybe now we don't have the technology but why not in a near future just to foresee what would be the legal odds or the legal issues that we could encounter but nowadays um, how can we uh, um, regard such such question is it like too far away from our our visions again of course we've seen people uh, waking up from a coma uh, unfortunately, uh, someone after a, ha a heart attack can come back afterwards. I mean, there are people that have been declared uh, uh, to be in a coma and then afterwards have come back to, let's put it this way, to normal life. Also, people that they are not only in a coma, but also um, under a vegetative state, uh, they have no brain activity and then have come backwards. So 
uh, cryopreservation, uh, of course, law says something in, in those cases, but cryopreservation uh, brings out some interesting topics that uh, should be analyzed. And, and the reason I, I think it's, it's a good idea to have this, uh, this session today is in order to explore and to broad all the, um, all, all the types of discussion concerning the, the rights, obligation, advantages, and disadvantages around cryonics. Indeed, uh, we're not uh, endorsing that you should uh, make your own cryonic plans, but, but uh, what is important is, is uh, everyone should follow the legal um, advices of, of he or his or her own attorney, but again, uh, it's it's good to have a perspective on on cryopreservation uh, and see that it's a technology that now it already exists and and uh, but not because of of the application that that we will uh, talk about nowadays uh, in this session concerning the whole body human uh, cryopreservation uh, nowadays exists because we can speak about cryopreservation of uh, embryos, uh, like also cells. There are some uh, already established procedures according to the laws of some internal and the internal laws of some of some member states of the international community. For instance, uh, the country that I am from, Spain, <clears throat> they are, they, uh, Spain has already enacted some laws concerning um, the protocols to follow uh, for the cryopreservation of some embryos and cells and and so on. But, but again, uh, Talking about not only embryos but the whole uh, cryopreservation of a of a person, it brings a new a new idea, a new challenge to to law. Uh, and of course, it's a very exciting topic to discuss. But of course, it's a very sense a very sensitive topic that we should uh, we should uh, deal with this uh, very carefully because uh, it will open the floor to a discussion uh, from a legal, ethical. Uh, religious perspective. There are so many sensitivities, so many um, opinions uh, in this regard. So uh, it's it's good to have an open mind uh, and and respect everyone's opinion on this because of course um, it's uh, anything related to thana, thanatopraxy, right? And 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 the funerary uh, practices of of the of 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 some. Uh, of some places in 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 Europe or the U.S. or Japan. I mean, uh, is uh, happens because of a tradition, right? So we shouldn't like uh, we should respect uh, such tradition and the opinions of everyone. So I think it's a very delicate uh, matter. It's, it's a very uh, it's a matter that has to be dealt with pro uh, with uh, a moderation in order uh, just to again. Um, to to broad to open the floor to any discussion, but with with respect, uh, I believe. So uh, respecting everyone's sensitivity is very important. But again, of course, it's a nice topic to to treat. So David, if you have any question, I I, I have brought a, um, a PowerPoint. So with your permission, I could I could just uh, share it. Thank you. So uh, the title uh, is tentative indeed, uh, solving the key legal and policy issues that are hindering uh, wider adoption. Again, uh, cryopreservation uh, is, is, a, is a concept that, uh, that has to be uh, defined and delimited, right? Uh, the definition of cryopreservation is to keep uh, under a very low temperatures, uh, freezing temperatures, uh, a body with the um, with the objective to reanimate that uh, that body uh, when the technology allows us to do so, and once uh, a cure ha has been found to cure the sickness the person has died from. Uh, in this in this regard, of course, that's um, th that's the bottom line. That's the idea of uh, every uh, cryonicist. So that once uh, the legal death of of a person is declared. Um, that person will be uh, applied some some technological and some cryopreservant, uh, you know, uh, treatments. Then uh, th that person will be stored, uh, carried, and stored in a cryonic facility. And then, in a near future from now, 
uh, with uh, with the expectation to be revived, right? So again, uh, the definition. Of course, there are, there are many many ideas around the definition of of cryopreservation, but the most important is the preservation of the biological function, because there's. Uh, uh, we could uh, we could ask ourselves uh, up to what extent we can preserve uh, a body uh, or a cell or an organ in uh, under freezing uh, or in freezing temperatures if there's no if there's no point to uh, to reanimate or to bring that organ or that or that person back to back to life right again so uh, we should. Um, define uh, cryopreservation and see uh, up to what extent the standards applicable to cryopreservation uh, can uh, can be applied to other type of similar techniques because there's a um, there's a debate around the the notion of, the notion of cryopreservation because people speak about cryonics cryogenics biostasis cryobiology there's so many similar terms um, I found out that there was an, an article on one of one uh, scientific magazine uh, from the 70s that referred it was uh, it was published by the University of Duke, I think, and, and such such uh, issue um, referred to the different type of, of definitions with with great uh, with great detail. So uh, what uh, has uh, caught my attention is that cryopreservation as a term refers to the, the preservation of the human body, but with the finality uh, to, um, to reach to a, to a stable and to um, reanimate state of that, of that body. Again, uh, now uh, that we are, we are talking about cryonics, we will speak and we will refer to the whole body. Uh, to the cryopreservation of the whole body, but again, uh, we we shouldn't lose track that that cryopreservation is also technology that is used uh, for organ transplants and also cells and also embryos. We shouldn't lose uh, this this perspective as well. Again, uh, cryopreservation is not the same as as cryogenics. Cryogenics is used in in physics and and other uh, science fields, scientific fields, because uh, of the of the possibilities that uh, the cryogenics have to because cold is capable to narrow the size the density and the weight of a matter so it can be carried out to space with less um, with, with less budgetary efforts from the from the launching state so cryogenics is also used in physics as well so that's why I I, I always I always um, enhance the the need to to be clear uh, with the terms and try to use them accordingly because of course it's a um, it's a new it's of course we shouldn't we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves at all but we should bear in mind that that is uh, cryopreservation as a legal uh, idea is uh, a, an idea that is uh, developing right now and there's a lot of a lot of effort to do right so from the i i, I started this initiative to encourage uh um you know um engaging different efforts to understand how cryopreservation can be studied and and up to what extent cryopreservation can be now uh protected or can be uh, legalized or can be regulated but uh, i will insist that this is a matter that depends and on the internal laws of the states of the, our international community. So, uh, of course, all these um, practices that are are carried out uh, to take care of the human remains of or of a body uh, that has passed away correspond to the internal laws of the state uh, or where the where the body is located. Right? Someone. Um, passes away in uh, in France or Italy or Germany or uh, whatever country you you might think of, then the internal laws of such state will uh, govern the whole procedure. That's that's what I found out so far. Again, what I would like to to say is that uh, mm, we are not endor endorsing cryonics in any way. You should go to your legal specialist to find whether in your region. Uh, it, is this possible and up to what extent uh, is, is possible to do it or not? Because there are many, many ideas that we will, that we will find out during uh, this, this research. 
Uh, and also, um, during my presentation, I would like to, to focus on the challenges that, that cryopreservation as a, as a, as a practice um, uh, propose, right? And also, uh, in, of course, I'll give you the example of, of Spain as a country of the European Union. Then uh, we have our own laws concerning uh, cell cryopreservation, of course, uh, human cryopreservation has not been regulated, but that mar there, there might be uh, a spot uh, where to enter this technology into. But again, it's a long road still, because uh, Spain, of course, is a is a country that that has its uh, its traditions. Uh, of course, uh, the majority of people uh, here um, has a religious background, and of course, there's a lot of sensitivity. And in order to convince to the entire national community, it's a it's a hard uh, thing to to do. So uh, it has taken a lot of effort to to enact documents on on euthanasia or or uh, abortion or any any other um, this um, new uh, topic that wasn't allowed like 50 years ago. So, but, but it has taken time. So cryonics needs time as well. So if you, if you scan the, the QR code that you find here on the, on the, on the, on the PowerPoint, uh, it will take you to the, to the website of, of the initiative. So you can check whether uh, materials or articles or any uh, news of interest you might, you might want to, uh, to check. So again, uh, what, in order to open the floor for discussion, I would like to um, to refer to cryopreservation. Is it a right uh, called um, right of cryopreservation, or is a right uh, of of the human to be cryopreserved? So that's that's a philosophical question that that all discussions should, should go around. Perhaps that's one topic. Again, also cryopreservation is a law that should, could be called a nascent state. It's a, a law that has to be developed. And, and even though there are articles published uh, in, in some scientific journals, it's, it's a law that needs to be uh, um, understood and, and cryopreservation needs to be like embraced by, by uh, for instance, international community in order to uh, reach to a certain level uh, or a certain degree of acceptance, right? So, uh, uh, cryopreservation or cryonics uh, as, a, as a technical concept embraces different types of, of, of laws. For instance, it has implications concerning family law because someone that wants to um, be a cryopreserved and has to go to the notary and, and sign this last will and also it has some, some inheritance uh, implications. The family can say, we, we do not agree. Uh, the heirs we can say, I'm sorry, but we don't think that's, that's fair. Or they can say, yeah, you can do, of course, whatever you want to. Indeed, there are a lot of moral and, and ethical connotations in that because people might think, well, uh, you're just uh, um, spending some money on something that will not happen. But who knows what what we will be able to do in the future now uh, there we have some scientists in spain that are doing um, amazing discoveries concerning rejuvenation and also uh, even the reanimation of certain uh, multi multicellular organisms such as worms so who knows what will happen and the idea of rejuvenation as well is also an, 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 an transhumanism both ideas are really linked to cryopreservation because um, if we can rejuvenate our bodies, why wouldn't we be able to use stem cells to reanimate uh, a body that has uh, already become deanimated? Let's use it this new word, right? Again, uh, following with the with the line of the of the PowerPoint, of course there are some commercial uh, topics that can be. Uh, can be underlined concerning uh, the arrangements uh, that a cryonic facility uh, can can do with the with the person uh, that wants to become a patient of such a cryonic facility. Also, some administrative 
uh, some administrative procedures concerning the legalization of all the paperwork concerning the cryonic facility or the person that once uh, has been declared dead, then it has to be stored, uh, preserved, and carried to the destination, right, where that person will be cryopreserved. Also, uh, of course, there are some European laws, some international laws that that should be um, should be regarded as well. So, uh, as as just as a as a storm of ideas um, to to bring out to the to our listeners. So, one one thing that uh, could be could be uh, discussed is. Can we uh, refer to the extinction of personality? Is that person that, that has already passed away uh, is no longer him? Will be some someone else? What happens with the uh, with all the rights that that uh, the deceased person has acquired? It's it's very interesting. So that's what um, I, that's why I refer that. For instance, cryopreservation. Um, I foresee that it will go through different uh, stages, right? Perhaps uh, it will be um, uh, considered as a suspended animation, kind of. So once uh, we find uh, a, a person that has, for instance, a uh, terrible sickness such as cancer, and then uh, the hospital uh, has the, the right technology, who knows whether in a near future uh, that person uh, can be a uh, preserved and under a suspended cryonic animation until the sickness has been cured. And in the same hospitals, in the near future, uh, uh, we will be uh, enjoying this type of technology. So it will not be uh, sounding like science fiction anymore, right? So, so this is just a, a tentative uh, idea. So I'm not trying to to define or or to make any any firm statement because again is a is a law or is a is a topic that needs to develop needs to be discussed and needs to be agreed uh, among all the states and the people of the forming the international community meaning the 194 states of the United Nations so it's not it's not a small task at all so <clears throat> um, of course. Um, just referring to some some topics, um, uh, the UK has its own uh, legal system based in the common law. So, of course, uh, the the way, uh, for instance, uh, countries uh, ruled by by the common law uh, regulations, they they have a, a, a different way of understanding. For instance, certain topics than than in Europe we might have. For instance, uh, the theory I, I recall when I was studying um uh, some some parts of the common law the theory of consideration so that that uh, common law and 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 uk law has some beautiful beautiful theoretical approaches that are really if you like uh, the legal uh, studies uh, then it's very interesting to to know about but again that's why i say that that um every country needs to deal with this idea uh, its own way and interfering in the internal affairs of a of another country would be a mistake in in my opinion of course uh, i'm sure you um, those of you who who know about uh cryonics in the uk know about uh, some judgments that that was uh, rendered concerning a, a cryonic case and uh, so um, the uk has a very strong uh, court tradition and and with very interesting judgments however for instance in spain um uh, as far as i know i haven't i haven't heard of a, a cryonic case uh, held by the the spanish courts uh, maybe maybe there is but i haven't heard uh, of it at all so again um spain needs to needs to uh, be uh, like um needs to to go through a, a procedure uh that goes, uh, in my opinion, uh, before the eyes of the of the public uh, of the public authorities. So, if there is a community, a cryonic community in Spain, capable to to um, to boost this this topic, this idea of cryonics, and if there's some uh, uh, popular initiative in this regard, then um, I'm sure that the that the authorities will will pay attention to the needs of of the of the people. If we can consider cryonic or the cryopreservation as a as a right. 
so again, uh, what I what I wanted to say in uh, in about the, the internal laws of the Spain. So uh, laws and science uh, works uh, using analog analog cases so we can study and we can go to another uh, to and explore a situation if we use the examples that that we have before from a similar experience right so again uh, according to the spanish law crime preservation is not a, a notion that escapes from the from the logic it it has been already used but uh, concerning cell cryopreservation and embryonic uh, cryopreservation, right? Uh, and it, indeed, uh, there are some some laws in Spain that that uh, that um, set out even the protocols concerning the cryopreservation uh, procedures using like stem cells or or proteinic or or you name uh, you name it those scientific i mean i'm i'm not into uh, into the into detail of the cryoprotectants but but again uh just uh, as an example i would like to say that 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 cryopreservation of cell cryopreservation is uh is protected by by the spanish laws but again human cryopreservation uh, could fall under uh, a hybrid category um, concerning the uh, the treatment of the human remains concerning the the thanatopractic uh, um, uh, leg legislative body. But but again, uh, we'll see that in, uh, uh, in a bit from now. So there are some uh, some regulations we have concerning the uh, national health system concerning cryopreservation of pre embryos uh, and how uh, to use it by oneself or or a third party and indeed cryopreservation as i said uh, is has not been regulated there's no uh there's not nothing concerning human cryopreservation and i wonder whether uh, it will require a form of a new legal instrument and in, in such case can we question the legal capacity or not of the person once it has been reanimated or uh will have the same rights and obligations that he had before. So, how can we uh, can we compare such situation as as a person that is in coma that that wakes up? Uh, can we call it waking up again? So it's like very uh, it's like uh, kind of changing the notion of of death uh, so far. I think if if prior preservation once uh, uh, proven, right? Um, because at the moment. Uh, uh, as far as I know, it has not been proven to, to work in humans, but if proven one day, it will change the whole paradigm of the legal status. So um, the questions that I, I bring out, is cryopreservation a fundamental right? Uh, is a right that has to be protected according to the UN Charter, for instance? And is the right uh, to decide or to dispose our uh, mortal uh, remains? Uh, it ha can be understood also as a, as a law uh, forming a framework uh, capable to regulate the post mortuary practices. Indeed, uh, we, uh, all the uh, cryonicists know that even we can speak about pre mortem cryopreservation, not only post mortem cryopreservation. There, there are some people that can opt out to, uh, to uh, the euthanasia, right? And then decide uh, to be a uh, cryopreserve, and 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 to be applied this euthanasia, and then go ahead uh, straight to the cryopreservation uh, protocols. Not not only the people. Uh, there are some people that don't want to wait until uh, the legal death happens uh, when it happens. Uh, they want to control the fact when they are going to die. So in, we imagine the case of a of a person that and that has a metastatic cancer and then he has only like one week to leave then then five days earlier decides well i want to do it so is there any right that that um, protect that person uh either from not doing it or from or or to do it so there's the double you know the flip side of the of the coin right so again also it's uh it's um it's a term that that refers to the latest um, technology uh, that that we will enjoy if uh, cryopreservation uh, techniques and technologies move move forward, such as um, how the next cryo capsules will be will be designed. What type of cryopreservers we will uh, will have in the near future? Is there any cryo ambulance working nowadays? 
So those ide uh, 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 ideas are kind of food for thought. So from the uh, from the activities of of the initiative, I I direct. Um, it's um, uh, it's a solo it's a solo effort because of the of the I think that the the will uh, I I I have that uh, the European institutions uh, should not disregard or should pay attention to uh, to the community that that is in favor of cryonics. So uh, I submitted a petition uh, to the European Parliament uh, information petition uh, which I am awaiting the the response. Of, of such petition, and and that petition refers to the uh, law uh, of called the EU, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, and that regulates human dignity. So I I bring the question to the to the Parliament, saying is uh, uh, the the right to be cry preserved a consequence of human dignity? So if we can decide uh, whether uh, to be cremated or to be embalmed. Can we decide to be cryopreserved as well? So, uh, can we uh, respect the law uh, uh, concerning the last will of the of the deceased person? Can we can we provide for some legal protection to that? And I I would like to bring out the case um, that uh, I I read. It, it's a UK judgment that referred that as long as the director, the funeral director, and the foreign cryonic organization are um, are in contact, and the and the um, internal laws of the uh, country of destination are complied with, then um, the the country of origin uh, shouldn't uh, bring any opposition concerning the 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 last will of the person that that uh, deceases. So uh, I I really like uh, the that judgment rendered by the UK court because it referred uh, that uh, the 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 procedure was not about whether cryonics should be uh, regulated or not. It was about if we should respect the uh, the will of a person that wants to uh, that is about to to die. So in this regard, but again, of course, I cannot pronounce uh, or I cannot give any opinion on on any any judgment or or any laws uh, uh, re uh, the, uh, regulated or or enacted uh, according to the internal laws of of any country. Because of course, um, I I am skilled only in Spanish law, right, and in European law. But of course, I I can I cannot give you a valid opinion. On how the UK laws work at all, because I, uh, I'm not um, a lawyer in the UK. I'm a lawyer in Spain. So, but again, uh, of course, uh, to the to the international cryonic community, it's a uh, it's a topic that is very interesting because it's a uh, it's a judgment that allowed uh, uh, a person uh, to be cryopreserved. So, it's very useful. So, some some further. Uh, reading uh, that I, I, I compiled uh, is, for instance, in Spain, uh, we have some regulations concerning the autonomy of the patient in the sense that uh, a patient can, uh, can decide what to do with his body once his or her legal death has been declared. Uh, there's another, we have another law regulating euthanasia. And we have also um, uh, another uh, regulation concerning the transplantation and procurement of organs, uh, human organs. Also, we have laws uh, concerning uh, burials in, in municipal cemeteries. Will we have in the near future, for instance, uh, cryo uh, storage facilities instead of cemeteries? Uh, it's a question that I would like to bring out, right? Uh, also, we have another law uh, concerning uh, the informed consent of the patient uh, that declares where uh, his body will be taken to. And in Europe, for instance, we have uh, the Convention on the Protection of Human Rights and the Dignity of the Human Being with, this, with respect to the application of, of biology and medicine. We have the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, one of the, the basic uh, uh, articles that, that sustain the uh, petition before the European Parliament is the human dignity. And also we have this convention uh, uh, with a, this agreement uh, enacted in 1973 in Strasbourg, and and refers to the um, uh, to the um, to the fact that um, that certain requirements need to be um, uh, 
um, set out in order to allow a, a body, a human remain to to be carried from one country to another. So it declares like it has some formalities that need to be uh, respected. So this convention, this agreement enacted in 1973 is very is very important, right? <clears throat> we have other other regulations concerning uh, the obtention and clinical use of human organs in Spain, for instance, and the territorial, the territorial coordination. That's why I say before that, that respecting the internal laws of every state is important because for instance, in Spain, we are divided by autonomous communities and we have like, like a three level of, of laws from major laws to local laws. So, so, and there are a lot of delegations. So uh, we, we live in a complex, in a complex scenario of, of laws and and every state knows best uh, its ways to to implement the the idea of cryopreservation according to the internal laws and regulations. In, and for instance, Catalonia, which is the the region where I, where I am actually, uh, we have some uh, regulations concerning uh, uh, regulating uh, funeral services. Uh, sorry, and also concerning uh, the mortuary sanitary police regulations. Because of course it's a health uh, issue. Uh, it's a public uh, matter, and it and it uh, concerns the public authorities. So it's even a matter of national security. So it's very important this topic. So, as I said before, changing a bit the topic. Um, uh, sorry, David, if I extend too much. Too much. So. Uh, what uh, I would like to uh, bring out is, are the ethical and social um, uh, challenges or advances applied to cryopreservation. Uh, can we, um, do we foresee that we will uh, build like a global consciousness around cryonics? Can we harmonize uh, in a near future concepts such as cryonics, cryopreservation, biostasis, cryogenics? Uh, can we like uh, merge and conciliate any, any um, opinion confronted? Um, is there any any way to uh, to foresee the the ethical change thanks to the evolution of the technological advances? What I've seen so far in law is that uh, law and and society follows technology uh, even uh, even now because uh, we have um, as as time goes by we have more powerful. Uh, memory units. Uh, we have cheaper uh, technological uh, devices that are that are sold out, but capable of doing more and more things. So technology is evolving very fast. So who knows if we will speak in the future about nanobots or or uh, half uh, bot cell, you know, capable capable of 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 arranging and fixing the. The body, uh, a, a human body, once this this body has been declared death, who knows, right? Uh, so again, uh, it's important to understand what are the technological demands of cryonics, cryopreservation, and biostasis, in order to, uh, because we have to uh, act fast because when the cryonic uh, the the cryopreservation protocols have to be uh, implemented in a body just after five minutes, about after his his or her legal death has been declared because uh, the body starts to de decompose fast. So it's, it's good to have like some preventive studies uh, just to check uh, whether the internal laws of the state where the body is located will respect such practice and procedure. So uh, I always refer that, that since uh, bodies need to be transported from one country to another, it's good to have like uh, the same protocols, uh, more or less, or the same established ways of 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 storing uh, the body or preparing the body, um, because you know uh, in that way we avoid um, legal gaps and and for instance uh, la uh, a lack of interpretation of of the of the paperwork in a sense. So uh, it's important to harmonize the protocols of every state. Uh, of the international community, that would be an, uh, a, a good, uh, a good practice. Uh, of course, the notion of international cooperation among states uh, that would be also an an, in, an immense effort that would be highly appreciated by the by the by the people. Also, um, uh, of course, uh, if the internal laws of of the states forming the the international community are capable to to enact. 
um, instruments uh, in the near future, then uh, it would be a great, a great idea to see whether such instruments are harmonized among them. So just to give a, a preliminary approach, I'm just about concluding, uh, about to conclude. So um, cryopreservation happens once the legal death of the person has been declared. We need to identify the existing laws applicable to cryonics or cryopreservation, and we need to identify as well which are the policy instruments around cryonics. Uh, the policy in the sense that all the administrative paperwork around uh, the funerary practices around cryonics. So uh, is there an established procedure that can be identified and can be put um, in, in under discussion uh, among different cryonic uh, organizations like to to have like a same or like a similar way to 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 act because of course the nature of the cryopreservants are very important because the better structure and the and the latest the technology is used so the the most updated so uh, will determine that uh, there are better chances to uh, to reanimate and not to deter deteriorate the body of the of the person that has been carried to a cryonic facility so is there an established procedure of cryonics uh, can be can we identify some uh, some similar practices so i since time is crucial, I think that would be a good idea, perhaps, to uh, to uh, prepare like a soft law, a document like a, like a document capable to uh, regulate uh, and all these all these topics, in order to have uh, to provide like a guideline or like a, like a common policy um, recommendation. So to uh, to be uh, taken into account by the cryonic institutions, it, it doesn't have to be binding, but but of course it's a start, right? So uh, some some future legal uh, issues around around cryonics and biostasis, I I have identified that of course uh, the acceptance uh, by public authorities is very important, the integration in the institutional and social. Uh, dialogue and uh, vocabulary of the people is also very important. Uh, of course, uh, the so-called public exception policy standards, for instance, one law uh, um, enacted in a country can be illegal in another country. This happens in international law. So, uh, for instance, uh, not mm, depending on the on the mentality of 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 the of the state we 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 are in, uh, we might find that um, that cryopreservation is not accepted and it's contrary to law. So that's why I say we have to, to treat this idea very uh, cautiously and because it's, it's a very sensitive matter that can hurt the sensibility of, of the people. So, so the internal laws of the, every state have to be respected and, and try to find out to what extent we could find like a common uh, you know, uh, uh, degree of acceptance, right? So the harmonization of protocols is very important in this regard. Again, are there any standards concerning transportation, storage, or revival of, pa of patients? Uh, I see uh, cryonics uh, and cry human cryopreservation also, not only as a, as a step uh, uh, or as a new practice for hospitals, for instance, uh, when I refer to suspended animation, I see that it's also a practice for uh, the new space era. So why uh, like a, a tripulation uh, traveling from uh, the, the solar system to another uh, planet outside the solar system can, can be uh, like cryopreserved or, or carried under a suspended animation? Uh, we've seen science fiction movies that some of the, of the technologies that we have seen in some science fiction movies now are science facts. So why uh, why not uh, we could we could see in a near future or at the end of the century like like human biostasis is possible mm, uh, to for astronauts. So why not? So again, uh, as a concluding remark, I would say and i'm ending uh, the the presentation that is uh, a law that has is uh, under development right it's very controversial it requires it requires prudence and uh, of course there's a great technological and social debate and there are also a lot of challenges but also there are some opportunities uh, concerning uh, then laws uh, innovation uh, the work um, 
there are some, of course, where there's a crisis, there's a, there's an opportunity, uh, I, I think. But also there's a challenge that, that of course, uh, society needs to um, take things slowly and see up to what extent we need to find uh, potential solutions or, or uh, to solve these, these things uh, in a peaceful manner, in the most peaceful manner, of course. So again, uh, we should solve, for instance, uh, some lack of consensus concerning uh, the nomenclature. Uh, in example, uh, cryogenesis or cryostasis or biostasis, we should like uh, have a clear idea in mind. Uh, if uh, not the users, but the practitioners uh, should have a clear idea of uh, what to say and how to say it and when to say it, right? So also uh, there's a need uh, for consensus uh, concerning the, the uh, storage, stabilization and transportation uh, standards. Also, some consensus concerning the cryotechnology, the cryo loss, and we need um, to attract uh, more interest from the authorities, either in my country, Spain, and the European institutions, uh, where uh, we have already um, accessed and, and asked for, for an opinion on, on cryopreservation and see if in the near future it is accepted or it will take uh, longer uh, than we expect. We don't know. But at least we will work out to to do our best in this so thank you very much and don't hesitate to ask any question you might think of well thank you very much jordi there are already eight questions in the q a window so we will come to many of them shortly so let's get started with a question about underlying philosophy now, a lot of uh, liberal society liberal in the general sense says of course we should uh, allow people to be free to choose but only so far as that individual choice does not uh, risk some other social problem i can swing my fist but not if it's going to land my fist on somebody else's nose that's the limit of my freedom so we might uh, accept that uh, people have some freedom over what happens to them when they die but if there is some collision with the broader social concerns, that's where things get complicated. So let's take auto autopsies. Sometimes the state says, this person died in strange circumstances. We need to be able to dissect their body, to open it up, to have a look at what's happened inside their heart, to have a look at what's happened to their brain. Whereas somebody who wants to be cryopreserved with an increased chance of reanimation in due course probably doesn't want their brain to be dissected in an autopsy. So what are you aware of in terms of laws regarding autopsies? And if I have a bracelet that says, don't autopsy me now, uh, please don't autopsy me on my death, is that going to be legally binding anywhere? That, or yeah. is there open a, a discussion on that point? Yeah, that's a very good question because one of the premises of the cryo cryonesis uh, concerning cryopreservation uh, of and the perfusion of the of the body, uh, one of the requirements is not to submit the body to an autopsy. So this is uh, a statement by some cryonic organizations. Uh, but but again, we should check uh, the internal laws of the state of that person, what uh, such laws say, and whether that person had a a last will or not. So of course, um, in order to to have an opinion on this would be, uh, would, uh, I would need more details. But again, of course, the internal laws of the states uh, of the state of that person uh, have uh, a lot of things to say because uh, it's a security uh, matter. So again, of course, we would have a conflict, and we would need like a, a quick reaction from the from the authorities uh, to the site before the the body uh, gets corrupted even more after after death so thanks let's take a question from charles horikami who is in uganda and he's asking about our control after we die not much of our body but of our financial assets because somebody might say well i'm about to die and i want to make sure that my financial assets are available to me when i am uh, reanimated possibly in the future do dead people have the ability, or people before they die, do they have the ability to restrict what happens to various financial instruments, or are they likely or vi uh, liable to be taken over by relatives or by the state? 
that's also very a very good question again the internal laws of the state of that person will have to decide what happens in in that case but uh, of course, in order to uh, to make sure that this can happen, one has to reach to, uh, to uh, his or her own uh, legal practitioner in the country. So, so decide what happened. Of course, uh, once a person uh, has been uh, has de been declared dead, uh, then that person has no longer any right and or any obligations uh, and all. All the money that 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 he or 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 she had uh, is uh, is being transferred to the to uh, to his or her heirs. So, and then what happens with with the money if there's some cryonic statement or cryonic last will? Uh, you know, uh, then can we create like a foundation or or like um, um, what is called in Latin institution uh, fide commissaria? It's called this way. We 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 don't know. Uh, it depends on the laws of the internal the internal laws of the state where the where the body uh, has been has been declared dead, and also depends on the nationality of that person, because uh, maybe we find out that there's a person that has one nationality passes away in a country, and then uh, the the cryonic protocols that are legal in the country of, of that person. Are, are illegal in the country where that person has passed that same person has passed away so it's it's not easy so it's all these points need to be like uh, regulated and foreseen before it happens so the uh, an extra uh, prevention effort has to be made for sure if someone really wants to arrange uh, make his own or her own arrangements in uh, concerning the cryonics so I can see that you are a lawyer. The reason I say that is that your answers quite often say, well, you should uh, consult your attorney. You should find out by yourself. To what extent do you want also to be a reformer? To what extent do you want to say, let's not just find out what the law is today, but here is how the law arguably should be in the future, which may be different from how it is today. Well, in the future, of course, uh, depending on on the will of the of the person that has made the cryonic arrangements. Of course, if that person is in favor of cryonics, uh, of course, a, a system in favor of of uh, you know to uh, to find these consequences or, or a system capable to provide an answer to that person in favor of, of his or her cryonic will, of course, it will be highly desirable. But of course, again, law is not for everybody. I mean, uh, law doesn't serve one single person. Law serves a community. So of course, that depends on the country that person is. So, so it's not for me to decide. But my opinion, of course, is that uh, it's good that the law regulates as many topics as possible. But of course, we will always find like uh, like uh, like an example of 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 um, you know that will require some extra study according to the personal circumstances of that of that person. Is part of the answer pick your community wisely? You have said that laws vary from community to community and from country to country. To come back to the question that Charles posed earlier about control over our finances. In a way, we are dependent upon the community that we allocate that finances to, to continue uh, decades, possibly even centuries, and to maintain an interest in uh, following up what we ask them to do, rather than uh, spreading the finances in an irresponsible or selfish way. So is the answer to some of this, pick your country well, maybe migrate if necessary to become a citizen of another country, and uh, is it also a matter of picking the right community of uh, people who are dedicated, it seems, in a long-term way to respecting the rights of the deceased? Well, uh, it's not for me to decide because it, it's, it's a decision that everyone has to make, right? But of course, uh, there are countries that, that they have uh, one way of, of looking at, for instance, euthanasia than others. They have one countries that that they have a different taxation regime than others, and there are countries that they have a more uh, easy. Uh, there's they have an easier approach to cryopreservation than than others, if any. Uh, so again, 
it's a matter of studying case by case. That brings me to a question that Brian Collins asks about, is there a global directory or database of laws that are about issues that are relevant to cryonics? And is this updated? And I know you've done research on this. In fact, some of your slides listed uh, some of these uh, relevant laws. But uh, how is the project coming along of uh, effectively a Wikipedia on cryonics uh, legal uh, hmm. issues? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, uh, of course, not that I know of. I mean, there are, uh, there are some efforts I've seen, uh, but concerning uh, you know, uh, engagement of different uh, legal sectors spread out in the planet just to create like a like a database of laws. But it's I haven't seen any any website uh, consolidated website so far containing this database of of laws. Uh, in the case I of the cryonic initiative I I have uh, is uh, the. Um, yeah, the the website contains uh, some some instruments, but they uh, they correspond to the internal laws of Spain and also to the laws of the European Union. Uh, I haven't I I haven't gone to the laws of other states because of course I'm not a registered attorney in those countries. But of course it it should be uh, it should be uh, and it would be very appreciated to to have like a database uh, containing all the laws of of all the countries. And that's why I say that that merging and and different efforts and in order to 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 create established protocols would be highly desirable that's why i i think it, it will be but it will happen in the near future and if people wanted to help contribute to this somebody might uh, be more knowledgeable for example about the law in canada or the law in australia or the law in china is that something that you can help to coordinate should they contact you to do that or is it something they should start by themselves well uh of course i'd love to help but it's of course it, it's a solo effort it's a matter of time and it's it's uh, time is consuming so uh and it's uh like a non-profit uh initiative i'm i'm having so uh, what i would what i would um suggest is that uh, any person interested in cryonics can contact his local cryonic group and then create like like uh, like an organization in order to to bring down the different challenges and once we find out that that there are different organizations in in the world created we could meet in a in an um, international event uh, on a yearly basis why not that would be great but of course it's a matter of 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 budget and it's a matter of of time and and now as i said this initiative is like a solo effort but of course um uh, all these efforts have to be funded in order to work out so so it's um now it's it's not possible that i i i'm not capable of of reaching more uh you know uh, of enhancing my scope otherwise that would be too much very sensible we all need to focus otherwise we fail to achieve even what we uh, smaller things that we set out to do but I guess this is uh, an example of a general issue with cryonics, which is that there are many cryo-free riders. In other words, there are people who are thinking, well, in the future, they might want to be cryonically preserved. And at that stage, they'll allocate some of their funding, personal funds to their own cryopreservation. Whereas it would be better for everybody if more people felt some uh, obligation or some uh, inclination to provide some of their funding now to support this kind of projects, the legal research projects, also the biological research projects. And then with more funding could be made available in the short term, well before people are on the point of death, there's more chance that the laws will be in improved state and indeed that better cryopreservation techniques could be uh, in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed, indeed. I mean, um, if uh, now we, uh, we have just... Uh, arrived to this point where where uh, now everybody in the cryonic community think that it's about time that we have like a like an international instrument i hope that again in the near future who knows five ten years from now uh, bearing in mind how long it takes to enact uh, a law uh, it takes like more somewhat around seven years to enact a directive 
a European a directive of the European Union. So, so who knows whether uh, if within the next five years we'll have a, a soft law instrument uh, in cryonic regulating cryonics. So, so again, I'm I'm always uh, happy to to hear initiatives and ideas from from people, so they can contact me to my email address or they can access the the websites. So I'll be happy to discuss any any collaboration of course and i'm sure that if we 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 find that that the authorities are of any any country are are not uh, posing much restrictions on cryonics i'm sure that in the near future we will have uh, cryopreservation as an alternative to embalming or uh, cremation so that would be the the idea there's a general theme that's emerged in several of the comments that i've seen on youtube and on the Q&A and in the chat, which is that we're a bit irresponsible in exploring this because frankly, it's all science fiction. This stuff won't be a reality anytime soon, maybe not for centuries. After all, the body is full of trillions of cells. Uh, Kim Solis, uh, who has a lot of medical knowledge himself, points out that uh, there isn't any successful reanimation of any significant organ, even rabid kidneys, which is one of the most famous cases. They only seem to work after reanimation about 40% of the time. And even then it's not clear in what circumstances kidneys will work after reanimation. So it seems to be a long way into the future. So arguably, Maybe we should be spending our limited resources on other more pressing things and that this project is a bit of an indulgence. How would you answer that? Well, my answer is that I respect every opinion. So I cannot, of course, confront that opinion at all. I mean, every, everyone uh, has the right to have his or her own opinion and, and that's it. So I think that, um, that there are people that, as well that are against of of people of astronauts flying to space, uh, they uh, but thanks to space missions, um, cure for for certain sickness has been found. Also, if we look at the past, um, it was uh, if we go back to the Middle Ages, so uh, people thought that flying was completely beyond uh, useful, and and it was uh, there was no point in in researching about flying a man flying. How can this happen? Nowadays, we have tons of planes flying uh, every single uh, second, I would say. And, but again, of course, every opinion uh, has to be respected. Why not? And even though the opinions that are against um, this technology can provide some useful information, because the reasons why that person is against maybe are the reasons that can help to uh, to facilitate this the cryo cryopreservation technologies um, be accepted by by the society. So I don't know any any shape of as long as it is with respect um, any any uh, discussion or any kind of uh, conversations around cryopreservation are, are welcome. So I'm always happy to hear these opinions because there's something useful behind this. You're admirably open-minded again. So maybe, again, I might call you a lawyer, but uh, uh, I wonder about this uh, point of view. There is a point of view that says that by failing to hurry up with chronic preservation, we are committing a terrible crime, a terrible sin, that as we look back in the past ages, in previous uh, decades, previous centuries, we are often horrified at what people did then, the way that uh, slaves were abused, the way that women were de deprived rights, the way that young children were forced to work in factories. And we shudder and we think, well, thank goodness we're not doing that kind of unenlightened things now. But maybe in a few decades time, people will look back at us and say, you barbarians, you allowed so many people to have no possibility of uh, reanimation because you foolishly uh, burned up their bodies in crematoria, you put their bodies in the ground where they were eaten by worms, eh? whereas with relatively little cost, you could have cryopreserved them and then be ready for, in the future, them being reanimated by technologies which we can only uh, vaguely conceive of today. So, I mean, do you ever feel sympathy for that kind of crusading argument that says, actually, this should be a much higher priority? 
Well, um, this type of, of, of reasonings are, are really normal because, of course, time flies, society changes, and human, uh, humankind needs to adapt to the changes of the society, uh, the environment, and the technology uh, is using. So it's normal that the way things, uh, that we see things now, uh, is completely different uh, than the way uh, the society that, uh, in the future will see uh, the same the same topics. For instance, uh, the way um, uh, a person is uh, su uh, under, uh, submitted to a surgical right intervention. So maybe in a near future, only robots, high precision robots, uh, perform certain types of of operation. And, and doctors will be just directing the main parameters behind a, a computer. Um, uh, or maybe uh, different, different technologies will be, will be applied to prevent, for instance, cancer to, to come out by only analyzing the DNA. But this technology uh, looked uh, with the eyes of a person from the Roman Empire would be completely um, mind-blowing so of course uh there's this uh there's this uh saying from one of one philosopher that said that i think it was uh arthur c Cla arthur c Clarke that said that any technological resemblance to magic uh, entails or is an, ab an evolution of the of society itself i think that he refers something like this when he was uh, talking about the future of of humanity right so um, it's normal to have this kind of uh, confrontational debates here. Well, consider heart transplant. That was amazing. The yeah. possibility that uh, somebody whose own heart had failed could be given decades of extra healthy life by that uh, heart transplant. And initially people said, yuck, that's terrible. Uh, he will have some part of the soul of the deceased person inside him or herself. And uh, there were some opposition to it, but uh, now that uh, almost magical procedure is happening relatively op often. And it's not the desirable end goal. It would be far better if uh, people's heart could be replaced possibly by synthetic hearts that wouldn't require waiting for someone else, somebody else to die. But it is an example of how attitudes can change once we become used to what uh, technology can deliver. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I mean, medicine, the medical uh, discoveries are so um, so uh, astonishing that 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 they are doing wonders. For instance, uh, concerning heart surgery, I've seen that one of the arteries was like uh, in a case was uh, was collapsed, had collapsed, and then uh, using a vein uh, located near the femur of the person they were carrying like a like a butt to clean the, the sorry the pipe of the of the of the artery of of the heart so that that's uh, amazing technology on even facial reconstructions or titanium implants or i don't know you name it i mean uh, the the state of the art of of the medicine uh, is incredible nowadays i'm sure that in the near future um with one pill, we will uh, prevent any cancer form that we'll have. Why not? I mean, uh, at the beginning of last century, people were dying, uh, was dying of, of, I don't know, of sickness that nowadays nobody would think for a single minute that you would die from that. So... I think in 1900, the four most common causes of death in, in the, the United States were tuberculosis, influenza, uh, gastrointestinal infectious diseases, and pneumonia. And uh, some people still die of these diseases in some parts of the world. Far too many people uh, die of some of these gastrointestinal diseases, for example. And uh, people still die from time to time of flu and pneumonia. It's true. But uh, the proportion of people who died of these has shrunk enormously. And so in the future, there may be similar treatments to whatever is causing people to die now. If we d uh, had somebody with the uh, Black Death now, the Black Death killed enormous quantities of the population from time to time, we wouldn't be terrified because we know how to deal with that particular infection now. So in the future, we will surely have more possibilities than we have today.
let's come back to one or two more of the practical questions. There are several questions to do with transport between different countries. Charles Horikami asks about a, if, I mean, I think you raised this point already, but it may be worth exploring that if you are in one country when you die, but you're still a citizen of another country, which a set of laws takes precedent if uh, chronic preservation was illegal in one country, but not in another, how does that get resolved? And there was a related question, let me find it. Uh, yes, by Brian Collins. And uh, if you are preserved in one country, because that's allowed there, but you're worried about what may change in the law in the future, are the mechanisms to move bodies from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction? I think that has happened in, Cal in, in America. Bodies were moved from California to Arizona and, and later. So have you more insight into the laws about uh, transport and applicability? Yeah, this uh, agreement, um, the Strasbourg Agreement uh, that was signed in 1973, uh, it, it uh, includes some re uh, regulatory you know, um, principles concerning uh, uh, the paperwork and, the, and the, you know, the unification of criteria. Uh, uh, that has to be uh, respected by by the states signatories of that agreement, right? And also, I would also suggest to check the policy, uh, uh, the insurance policy of of that he is using. That maybe um, there are some uh, useful clauses concerning repatriation. But again, uh, uh, I would always advise to go and visit a lawyer concerning these things, your local lawyer, because uh, the laws that are applied in the region you are uh, are the ones that uh, are into force. So um, there's no point in me uh, talking about another regime or legal regime because, of course, I'm not uh, knowledgeable of of the laws uh, in the U.S. at all. So. There's a suggestion that's been made a couple of times. Uh, one anonymous attendee has raised uh, this point, and I've heard it before. The idea that somebody can make a bargain with the state. They could say, all I want for my future cryopreservation is my brain. That's all I need. And so I'm willing to donate all the other organs in my body for organ transplants for other people, provided the state will take care of uh, cryopreserving my brain. Uh, what do you think about that as a, a possible uh, bargain? Uh, well, um, currently, uh, some cryonic organizations, they offer the possibility to go for a neuro uh, cryopreservation or the full body cryopreservation. That's up to the, up to the person that, that decides what, to, what, what type of cryo, cryonic plans to follow, right? In my case, uh, of course, uh, the, I, I respect both both choices. I, I think that a full body cryopreservation preservation will give a huge ins, uh, perspective to the future scientists to see what type of, of structure uh, do we, we had in the past, right? So, and how to, to build it, uh, to make the closest resemblance to what we were, but younger. Uh, but of course, uh, people that that opt out for the neuro preservation uh, say, well, in the near future, we'll be able to uh, to build uh, our own synthetic synthetic bodies, uh, and using just the the information contained in the DNA, it will be more than enough. So yeah, that's right too. So um, it's just a personal perspective. I think that the more information we give them, the better. So, uh, but anyway, both, both uh, solutions are, one is cheaper than the other, that's for sure. Um, and both, but both solutions are okay, of course. There's a question by Gordon Silverman about quality control over cryonics organizations, quality control over whole body uh, mechanisms and others. If we want more public acceptance of cryonics, Maybe it's not just a matter of trying to change the laws. Maybe it's a matter of ensuring that people are confident that uh, they will be given the best possible treatment. So are you in favor of some kind of a certification system or approval system, whereas cryonics organizations are somehow uh, celebrated or when they meet criteria, and those that aren't meeting these criteria are publicly shunned as being 
cowboys or, or similar? Yeah, that's a, that's a really important question, very important question. Uh, and of course, uh, it's very, very necessary to, to provide a, an answer in this regard, because I'm in favor of the creation of uh, standards concerning uh, cryopreservation, right? We should create standards concerning data and information that capable, uh, you know, uh, such data has to be readable, capable uh, to be uh, sent to one from one place to another, and 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 to be uh, harmonized in order to provide information that is readable and different uh, so different organizations can can uh, study the information containing such data in order to implement the best cryonic practices again of course this should be like an iso like uh, standard of quality of every single cryonic organization so as long as we have uh, a set of protocols and a code of good practices and and so on we'll be able to define the best quality uh cryopreservation standards uh, uh procedures uh for stabilization transportation and storage and reanimation of of bodies so it will take time let but me take it's necessary let me take one more question from brian collins who asks about what happens when uh, cryonics organizations go bankrupt obviously we don't want that to happen but in case they have already got a certain number of uh, bodies in cryopreservation and they hit some financial difficulties, should the state in some sense be responsible in the way that the state sometimes gives a financial guarantee to certain types of savings? If the banks fail, you get all your savings guaranteed up to a certain level. So should society be somehow underwriting these chronics organizations or is that nothing to do with the uh, a social responsibility at all and it's just up to the individual cryonics organizations yeah that's also a great question because uh, behind every question concerning the law there's the idea of security so uh, are we uh, uh, defendless uh, behind uh, a, a bankruptcy procedure because bankruptcy entails the according to some legal systems the extinction of the personality of the company so the, that company uh, no longer exists and some some uh, companies that go uh, um, through a bankruptcy proceeding they 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 can just sell their assets to another company in order to uh, to reactivate uh, the activity of that of that company i don't know it depends again to the internal laws it depends on the internal laws of the state where that company is located so of course what is desirable from a person that, from the perspective of the person that that supports the cryopreservation, and even uh, from the perspective of the patient, what is desirable is that uh, the, the the rights of the people that have uh, opt out for a cryopreservation plan are respected. That would be highly desirable. And of course, uh, for instance, why not uh, discussing the existence of a registry of cryo uh, cryonic institutions that uh, such registry is public and then and, uh, such registry contains information of the patients and also uh, some financial information of the of the institution who knows and in order for the government to have a guidelines but again it's a matter of uh, the loss of the internal uh, the internal loss of every state to move uh, and to and to work in the in that sense but i'm sure but again it's a it's a law uh, laws around cryonics uh, are just uh now being discussed on a kind of embryonary basis it's so new that uh it's it's very rare that that we might encounter such level of discussion nowadays uh, i'm sure that there will be many many topics and issues concerning cryopreservation rights and that will appear in the near future but of course uh, we shouldn't look to the other way to the other side we should pay attention to those to those ideas because it's a possibility it can happen of course uh, but hopefully not but if one day happens we need to to assure that the rights of the people will be will be granted so and, uh, and i'm in favor of of that as well but but again it's difficult it depends on the laws 
uh, of of the state where the decorating facility is located and of course again it's, it's beyond my my possibility so i'm just researching uh, the the legal constraints and uh, from a general perspective but I, again going that into that detail that's that's the job of the of the legal practitioners in that area it's time for maybe a few more questions and then, by the way, we'll take a short break and then we will open up to a more informal session in which anybody who is still here is welcome to turn on their microphones and cameras and raise the points which haven't, we haven't had a chance to explore. And there are many good points in the Q&A and in the chat that I haven't had time to deal with uh, fully. But let's try and go through a, a few more uh, quick questions. I would like to ask about space because it was noticed by Martin Bialiki, amongst others, that your slide seemed to have a picture of Mars in the background. So is not, maybe not an obvious choice for the background for a, cryonic, a talk on cryonics. Uh, Charles Horikami asks, you know, uh, to what extent are your interests in space law and cryonics law dovetailed? Because in the future, maybe we will be having people in space who may need to be cryopreserved. So could you talk about that, the intersection of Mars and space and cryonics? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm a space law fanatic. <laughs> I really like this topic. And of course, I love this uh, type of laws that, that, that move. Um, uh, is cap those laws are capable to move a whole society uh, because they bring uh, new challenges, new technologies, uh, new solutions to to the way we see things, and and of course um, it, uh, those topics uh, open the the perspective of of how and who we are as a society. So um, it's important. So again, uh, space law, even drone law, environmental law and cryonic law uh, those those disciplines uh, they 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 might go they might go together and someone could ask me why do you think that environmental law is relevant to someone that supports cryonics well would you like to wake up in a future where there's no earth or no climate so you should better support environmental laws as well so of course we want to to be reanimated in the future uh, where uh, we uh, we can enjoy uh, a healthy climate. Uh, we would like to enjoy uh, uh, nice temperatures, not extreme weather, and of course to be in a in a future that where society uh, has managed to compensate the failures, and so there no wars exist anymore. Uh, of course, so then why space? Why space law? Well, maybe uh, we need to go into hibernation before, uh, before the trip in order to travel from one place to another and to make sure that our vital, uh, our, uh, you know, our constants are like kind of uh, put into a minimal, minimal state of, of activity to warranty that we won't uh, age during all that trip because we are talking about distances of light years. But, but again, maybe in the near future, we don't need to travel to Alpha Centauri. We will just use a laser and a, and a microchip that it will be sent through a laser and we will, uh, that microchip will carry like, a, like an artificial intelligence uh, uh, device that will give us full information and it will do like an immersive um, uh, session of our conscious carried to that to that planet extrasolar planet so but again um of course cryopreservation preservation and mars i mean uh maybe uh of course uh, mars uh we can fly from mars to earth every two years because that's when the planet gets closer uh its orbit uh, gets closer to to the, uh, to the orbit of planet earth so then uh, every two years uh, can um can uh, space missions be launched uh, with the with the warranty that uh, we will reach Mars in the shortest period of time. So uh, instead of waiting two years with our arms crossed in Mars, maybe in the near future we opt for a cryopreservation uh, session lasting two years, where we we do not even uh, uh, realize what's uh, what's happening. Because instead of waiting two years on a planet, maybe we can we can stop our 
our vital signs for just two years, and then we can work uh, capable of flying. I mean, at the use of technology, we, we nowadays don't realize how uh, we will use technology in a near future, and it will be mind blowing. That's what I think. So these are great topics to explore informally. My goodness, there's lots of uh, things we could come back on in these particular questions. But I, I want to draw back from environmental law to the laws over suicides. And you mentioned uh, that there were possible connections between the euthanasia laws and cryonics laws. You mentioned euthanasia as an area which the laws have evolved over slowly, but there is some growing consensus of what's sometimes called death with dignity. There are drawbacks to legalizing euthanasia, but there are many people who want the right to commit suicide uh, when they feel their lives have no longer a possibility of uh, getting better. Now, some people who want to be cryopreserved may choose to be cryopreserved before their brain deteriorates completely under the kinds of brain cancers you mentioned. So to what extent can you comment on the overlaps between the big initiative for death with dignity, uh, uh, euthanasia, and the possible cryothanasia options? Well, uh, of course, it's a, it's a very delicate matter because uh, it, uh, it touches the, the sensitivity of the, not only the person that wishes to do so, but also his or her relatives and also the international, the national community where that person is living and also the international community. And so there are so many perspectives uh, and so many ideas around this that it's very difficult to provide for a single, for a single answer. So what I would say is that uh, that that person, of course, that really wants to opt for that reason uh, to to establish and to study the situation, go to his attorney, her attorney, and and they will uh, assist him the best way uh, uh, he or or she can. Because I'm sure that there are also some ethical ideas. There are also some some uh, professionals that are very capable to to provide for an assistance in this case again uh, the notion of premortem uh, cryopreservation is a is a notion that uh, for instance uh, you have a, a person that has signed the last will and that that will contains the idea as you have exemplified and explained very well so maybe it's included all in there so again, it will be just a matter that, for instance, my brain no longer functions, but then uh, my, my, the situation and, uh, of my body uh, does no longer warranty that I'll be active, I'll be present. So I don't know, it's a, it's a matter that has to be dealt by the local uh, authorities and the local area where the local community of uh, where that person belongs to. So it's the laws of that place that re will regulate up to what extent that person has certain capabilities of uh, of uh, movement or not. I don't know. It, it, it's uh, it's a very a delicate matter that depends on the laws of every of of the region where that person is located. So I cannot provide you for a full uh, statement applicable to everyone. But again, of course, as long as it's respectful and and. Uh, dealt with care and of course and and respect so it's it's good to me so Jody in a moment I'll give you a chance to make any final comments I would like to briefly run through what uh, some other initiatives are that people may want to explore we've had this session today led by yourself Jody let me point out that there is an event happening in Arizona at Scottsdale very soon so actually very soon indeed it's june the 3rd to the 5th it is a three-day conference organized by alcor who are celebrating 50 years of existence so that's a long time for an organization to exist and obviously they're looking forward to another 50 years and more than that and they're talking about plan a for cryonics which means that instead of people thinking oh cryonics is my backup plan uh, because there's going to be lots of rejuvenation biotechnology coming soon. Maybe it's more appropriate for people to be more realistic and think, well, maybe there's not going to be a longevity escape velocity in the next 10 or 20 years. And so we should be putting more focus onto chronics. And this conference will have a lot of chronics experts speaking. 
as well as some distinguished people from outside the normal uh, sphere of chronic speakers, there's the distinguished philosopher of mind, David, David Chalmers, and there is the pioneer of synthetic biology from Harvard, Professor George Church. So I know it's short of time to organize to go there, but if you haven't heard of this conference already, maybe some people should explore it quickly. It could be the difference between your own death in unfortunate circumstances and long-term cryopreservation. Other things that's happening with London Futurist, there's a book that I'm almost finished writing myself on some of these big topics, in particular the adoption of fast changing technologies in ways that will be for humanitarian benefit rather than a terrible distress. So this book is called The Singularity Principles and you can find the details of that online on, for example, the Transpolitica site. So I am now open for reviews on the material which is available there. One of the biggest uh, themes underlying our discussion today is the need to improve general knowledge, general education. How can people learn more about these important topics? And how indeed can we be better at taking advantage of insights from neuroscience to allow people to learn more effectively, more quickly, more profoundly? That is the subject of a forthcoming London Futurist event in three weeks time from today. It's got two distinguished educationalists, Sheila McCreen and Jennifer Fugate, who have co-edited a newly produced volume on embodied cognition, the future of teaching and learning. So any of us who are interested in education should probably look out for that event and look out for other events that London Futurists will be organizing. So that brings me back to today's event. I noticed in chat, in uh, YouTube, one comment has uh, been, this is a heavy topic by uh, the user candidate. Uh, and I think it's true. This is a heavy topic. It's got lots of big philosophical issues and it's appropriate that we gradually get used to having this discussion without being shocked, without being weighed down by strange feelings. So it's great that you have erased this, Jordi. Another comment there is by Reda Vasinius. Thanks for a great session. So it has been a heavy session, but also a great session. And I fully endorse that as well. Uh, you have a uh, pointed to things that many of us haven't been thinking about enough and arguably deserve a whole lot more of a general discussion. Jordi, what would you like to say to wind down this event before we move into a more informal session? Uh, thank you. I just want to thank you for your hospitality and the kindness and, and thank you all our attendees. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, happy that they enjoyed the session. So I'm sure that in the near future we will bring more answers. Of course, uh, we I have addressed a petition, of course, in front of, before the European Parliament. Also, the People Defenders and Europe has received a communication from from me concerning uh, the up to what extent the question uh, concerning up to what extent we can we can protect the the cryopreservation rights of people or we need uh, to form like another committee a separate committee uh, gathering different opinions of experts so who knows i'm what will happen in the future but i'm sure that if we work out you work hard then we will find some results why not thank you there's another audience comment from Brian Collins who says, not only is this very interesting and informative, but there is a case for a second talk in the near future on this same point where we could uh, understand how your initiative is progressing, what might be holding things up, what might be the opportunities for people to become more involved. So we should look forward to bringing this topic back and having a more uh, informed, more uh, interesting uh, wider discussion. So thanks very much, Jody. I'm going to switch off the recording now, and then we'll move into a more informal mode. Thank you. Thank you.